You know, some of us here are in marriages that were broken by teenagers, and, and that's no one's fault. But there's also a lot of people across this country who they are here today with their wives, with their children, and their wives and their children have been supporting this take for decades. And to those women, to those mothers, to those children, I say thank you. So the agenda for the morning in the next five minutes, Mr. Graham Sturgeon and his wonderful wife Julie are going to be leading us out at the uh, car and trailer. Anyone who's seen Facebook see Jim Hilton in the band 1080 van. It's uh, feared all over New Zealand by the uh, Department of Poisoning, or as we like to shorten it down to the Cons Department. I'm just going to say at this point, the Cons Department are friends of mine. I admire them. We share many things in common. And I do not hold it against them that they drop poison all over our country because everyone knows that these days, for the last 25 years, that's what they're paid to do. The real criminals in this, the real criminals, the health ministry and the environment ministry that allow that to happen with no protection for our children. So to part of the conservation, guys, I salute you. We've got a common goal. Unfortunately, you've been read down the wrong path. The order for the march then, Mr. Grant's is going to drive out in just a minute now. That vehicle's gone. He'll be followed by Jim Hilton and the uh, Ben 1080 Walker. And uh, we've got the honour this morning of being led out by that wonderful Piper Phil. Big round of applause for Phil, please. That's actually Phil's. Um...
like to hand you over now to the uh, first speaker of the day. And uh, if anyone happens to have an agenda and know who the first speaker of the day is, I'd really appreciate knowing that. <laughs> Thank you for letting us stand on your ground today to unite brown and white against the scourge of eco-terrorism. I choose my words carefully, folks, and I'm happy to discuss each and every one of them. But if you care to look to Section 5C of the recently passed Suppression of Terrorism Act, you will see that Bill English is directly contravening Section 5C of the Terrorism Act. He is knowingly doing harm against the people of Muterini. And I choose that phrase, Muterini, for a reason, because that's how it's described in the 1835 Declaration of Independence. If we want to start talking about the laws of the land, there's been a lot of discussion over how the Treaty of Waikiki stands, in my opinion, not that high. The Declaration of Independence stands right above the Treaty of Waikiki. But let's move from that controversial period in our educationally engineered society, and let's go forward 12 years to 1852 and the Constitution Act. The Constitution Act clearly states that where the practices of the Māori people are not repugnant to the principles of humanity, they shall be allowed to govern themselves. Now stick with me folks, this is Te Rally. I'm going to segue back to where we came from. In 1852, so at this point I'd like to hand over to our spokesman from Nadi Eight Hey, but I'll just, before I do, just to finish that off, the 1852 Constitution Act states that where the principles of the Māori people are not repugnant to the general principles of humanity, they should be they should be allowed to govern themselves. This puts the whole Declaration of Independence, Treaty of Waitangi thing in a context. More importantly, I'm going to leave you with this thought. The actions of successive National and Labour Party ministers, and I'm going to name them, John Falloon, Simon Upton, uh, uh, Ross Barrett when he split off by himself, Bill English, Helen Clark, these people have blood on their hands. These people knowingly have allowed this to continue, and uh, they are acting simply, folks, repugnant to the principles of general humanity. It's not enough that Bill English stands down because he got a report in 94 telling him all this as Health Minister. Their whole set of the government should stand down in my opinion. I'm going to pass you over to the Nadi Hayes spokesman. Thank you, Nadi Hayes. Thank you, Nadi Hayes. Thank you, Nadi Hayes. Thank you, Nadi Hayes. Kote <laughs> If I can keep in your matter,
Tore ira kapi ia ko te kuto. Te nga kuto. Te nga kuto. Te nga kuto ka. I can ask to translate. <laughs> we'll do that later. <laughs> Marky Hay welcomes you all here today. All the Tika Tree. Kautauma. All the, all the people, Tafiki Nui, Tafiki Roa, from far away, who have come to make it, to come to have your say, to share your message. And we welcome you, to welcome you into our Rohe. All the dignitaries, councillors, <coughs> representatives of various governments that are here today to listen to you, to listen to your quarter. Your thoughts on this, this, this subject. In my mihi, I acknowledge you all. And a special acknowledgement to our mohapuna, our grandchildren, that we leave behind a legacy for them to be able to carry on. We are, all, we are just the workers in between. Hey. We work hard so that we can leave our mokopuna a legacy. So we have to drive the message home about our whenua. It's hurting. The moana is hurting, becoming depleted. The whenua has been sick for a long, long time. When our timbers were stripped, our Cody was gone, it's gone, our daughter is gone. What you see now is third generation. The Pākehā brought with them in 1769 many things, some good, some bad. And I know hindsight is a wonderful thing, but we are living the effects of the bad things that are here today. Mercury Bay, Hitianga, hey, is suffering. We suffered 175 years. 175 years. And now we do our best to work with the Crown to make change. That is what is behind the Treaty of Waitangi. To reset at 1840, what should have been 175 years ago, Here to reset those relationships, not just for Nati, hey, but on behalf of you all. On behalf of you all. And we have such people here today. We have a, we have representatives from New Zealand First. We have councillors here, various kaifakahaere from the tribes, maybe here today. To you, I'm here. Somewhere, as I was saying, then they taught the Papa to fight. Right? It's the, the Papa to fight dock. On this side is Tangata Fenwa. Somewhere in the middle. And the people. Somewhere in the middle, we have to agree. We have to sit around that table and agree this should happen and that shouldn't happen. Get the pie. Get the pie. That's virtually what I'm saying. And I thank you all for coming here today and giving these precious hours to be able to demonstrate to the politicians, to, the lead, to, to all the leaders that are here and outside, to demonstrate to them how concerned we are about our pop. Here, here. Our one. Our representative, Shelly, Shelly Balsam on Nati Hay. This is her co-papa. We've delegated this mahi to her. And the instructions she will get from us will be to look at this 1080 thing, to look at it seriously. The Papa Atafai have a policy 
I wonder which they work. Pangata Whenua will have a policy under which they work. The public also will have a policy. And somewhere in between, we've got to get down to this problem which is poisoning our land. Yeah, yeah. 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 Not just it's polluting our waterway. And what of the tourists? What of the tourists? Because that's what our economy is going to be built on here. Of the tourists that come in here and they hear of this poison that is in our land. It's not a good look. Not only that, it's not a good, it's, not, it's going to affect us. It's going to affect everything that Ngāti Hei does. So somewhere in between, we have to get around that table with the politicians and the leaders and the public and you will have an elected representatives get around that table and make change. We've yes. got to do things differently. This is 2017. It's an election year this year, people. No. Hey. Yes. Hey, we need to have start to wave the big stick. Direct your fullest direct involvement, direct protest. Kia kaha, kia, kia, kia koutou. Right to your MPs. Kia koutou. We are very, very fortunate to be in this democratic process that allows us to be able to do this. Hey, 170 years, 175 years from now, we have been out of that process. We've never been part of it until now. And we want to work together with you to come to an amicable decision that will, where everyone is the winner. But the big winner in this has to be our mohapuna. In the land. Our mokopun. I've taken up so much of your time. We have many speakers here. Torera ka mihi atu kio koutou. Tēnā koutou. Tēnā koutou. Tēnā koutou kato. Yes, I am a proud Ngāti Hei Iwi member. I am a born and bred Kudianga local. As such, this makes me a passionate kaitiaki of this special whenua. My concerns are many with regard to protecting our rohi, but the one we are all here to address today is the rampant use of Aerial 1080. I acknowledge that DocStar have got a whole lot better at consulting with affected landowners before their poisoning programme. They have abandoned their bully boy attitude of the past. I do not necessarily hold DOC staff to account. They are merely following the instructions of our out of touch government. And so to the people that make these decisions, this is what I say to you. How dare you continually put poison in our drinking water? on the proviso of saving the birds. I know on this up and down poison program you have allowed a 40 metre buffer on some of the main rivers. But what about the contributing streams? What about the poisoned animals that come to the river to frantically drink the poison from their systems and die in that river or stream and stay there to rot? I have seen this firsthand. Unless 1080 and Brodificum or any other poison is some sort of miracle poison, keep them for use in bait stations only. Who is to say that this continual bombardment of poison over our native forest is not eventually going to alter or erode our native plant's immunity to disease, such as the myrtle rust that is attacking at present? We will only receive this answer when it is too late. At our Ngāti Hei Hui, our discussions on solutions all favour poisons and bait stations only, and more rigorous trapping programmes. These trapping programmes could easily be set up with DOC and locals and iwi as partners. It will create employment for the type of individual that is not suited to the nine to five indoors job. It will create opportunities for 
opportunity that will create industry of the kind that is good. It will be healthy for the community and it is possible. Kia ora. Thank you. Alright people, welcome to Wuri Anga. Um, most of you know who I am, but my name's John Allen, or as John Key calls us, a terrorist, or me, Gary, a troublemaker. The material truly says the whole problem with the anti 1080 movement is those pesky hunters. Well, if that's what we are, then I'm proud to be one. <laughs> Uh, you guys, I'm um, truly humbled by some of the distance that our speakers have come to speak here today. And very humbled by the effort of our people from here on the Coromandel and all over New Zealand, also Australia, to come here to show their solidarity and saying we've had enough of this. I'd like to acknowledge some of the long-term campaign, 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 oh, campaigners from off the peninsula. It's uh, John and Lindley Macy, Peter and Val Finlay, Rick Featherston, Colin Harris, Shelley Balsam, Ray Harner and Jeffrey Robinson, Graham and Julie Sturgeon, Bruce Haynes, Diana Halstead, Maria and Tad Mottle, I think it's right, Shane, Flea Reed, Pat and Quinn Whiting O'Keefe, Wendy Pond, Wendy Pond, Stephanie McKee, Tom Locke, Jennifer Green, Victor McLean, Arthur Apple, Backfield and Tony Brubich and Marcus James. Um, I sort of had a speech written the other day, but that's gone by the wayside. Um, and I sort of wrote another one, but so if I sort of jump around a bit, it's all good. Um, in 1994, myself and Colin Harris, as the founding members of the Woody Anger Pudding Pig Hunting Club, we were approached by John Gorkroger and someone from WRC to discuss the first Papakai T80 drop. We were told it would take only one drop and everything would be taken care of. 27 years later and they are still dropping with a frequency of every three years from now on. We are told that the Papakai is one of 500 ecological sites in New Zealand that will be poisoned every three years with or without monitoring. Now the monitoring they did this year for the Papakai block shows that we're within one or two percent of their target so i can't see any reason why they are doing it this year yes one thing with the monitoring that i've noticed is that they do the monitoring at the end of um, summer when the rat numbers are at the highest then they drop at the end of winter do more monitoring and claim success what they forget will neglect to tell us and the people is that mother nature takes care of the rat numbers by herself in the wild especially if we have a wet cold winter their numbers just plummet but they take credit for it the papakai totals 13,918 hectares the boundaries are the 309 the northern boundary and the tapu Glen, in the southern boundary the eastern and western boundaries at the back of privately owned land. The Papakai was one of my main hunting and trapping areas before the first drop. It had, it had um, good bird life, the fantails would follow us around. There was a wood pigeon that used to come for a talk when I stopped under a certain tree. Had a wall pork too. I used to try and knock my hat off my head when I went through a patch of tree fern. After the first drop, I found the wall pork and his mate dead and a couple of others in the next valley. Never saw the wood pigeon again, and over the next couple of drops, the fantails disappeared along with the other birds. That block has never, ever recovered to what it is. If 10 work, after 27 years, the papakai should be alive with bird life. When poisoners tell me that I'm full of shit, my answer to them is I challenge them to show me that after 27 years of aerial 1080, the papakai, the flourishing bird life that should be there. I also say that if they can prove that to me, I'll go away and they will never hear from me again. No one has ever taken me up on it. Um, 
I'd like to welcome our speakers here today. Um, Richard Proctor from New Zealand First, Clyde Graff from the anti Eighty Party, Samuel Longfield, Labour, Tony Brewich, Deputy Mayor, TCDC, Tony Fox, he isn't here today, but um, Colin will read out a statement that he has written for you. Kathy White from WRC, Shelley Bolson from Marty Hay, Jim Hilton, Marcus J, James, Joe Davis, and Victor McLean. These have declined or have previous arrangements. I invited Scott Simpson, and he's actually the um, Associate Minister to the Environment. I never even got a reply. You know, and he's our standing MP. Uh, Scott Summerfield from the Greens, he just sent me a what the uh, policy is, and I've read it before. Del Minogue, he won't be here. Sandra Gordy, but she does have other previous engagements. We even invited Greenpeace, and same thing, never got a reply from them. Must note that all speakers will be speaking on behalf of the respective organisations. Not all speakers will be speaking on behalf of the respective organisations, but for themselves. It's Tony Fox, Tony Brubich, and Kathy White. Thank you guys. Now I'll invite um, Richard Prosser to come up here and do the same. Hey everybody, um, thanks for the welcome. Thanks for the, this brilliant turnout and also for the brilliant day. It's, uh, it was nice and cold in um, Canterbury this morning when I got up at four o'clock to get the early flight to Auckland to drive here. And uh, it's actually Winter Festival in Rangiora this weekend. And uh, Matt Ducey, who's the local national MP, uh, and the Mayor get to dive into a big pool from the freezing cold water that's been left out overnight. And uh, I'm standing up here on the Coromandel in blazing sunshine. Uh, it's, um, it's sort of a semi bit of a homecoming. I grew up on the Harriki Plains and um, I used to drive trucks around the Coromandel for at one stage. I, um, I fell off the 309 with a load of wines and spirits about 25 years ago um, and I haven't been back since. So everything has changed a bit in that time. And um, when John got hold of me and said, you're having a rally, I thought, well, okay, this is one of the other hot spots for 1080 protest in the country along with the west coast of South Island. And actually, a rally like this would do them proud down there, so good on you. Um, I'm, the, I'm the guy they call the anti-1080 MP. I didn't start out to become that. I, um, I started uh, making noises about 1080 because I wanted to um, <clears throat> make a stand on behalf of hunters. Because, um, believe it or not, I um, used to walk the hills with a rifle. It's, um, it's, the job that I'm doing now is not conducive to that. But, uh, <laughs> You know, politics isn't proven. One day it'll come to an end and I'll get back out there. And uh, when I do, I want there to still be something left to hunt. Mm. And something for my kids to hunt. And their kids. Because one of the things that New Zealand First regards as very, very important is the right of New Zealanders to take food from the bush. And we can't take food from the bush if we're dumping poison over it. Now water. Now water. Yeah. So in the, in the course of uh, <clears throat> getting into 1080 and finding out about it, to make a stand for hunters, uh, the TV question sort of popped out of, out of the woodwork. I wasn't expecting it. And so I started looking into TB and possums and the Animal Health Board and Osprey. And one of the advantages of being in Parliament is that you can ask official questions through a mechanism that's not the same as the OIA. And you can ask questions directly of ministers. So we asked a lot of questions of the Minister of Primary Industries, who's responsible for Osprey, which is what the Animal Health Board was. The Animal Health Board kept very, very thorough records. And over the years from 2004 to 2014, over that 10 year period, the AHB autopsy, 120,213 possums from around New Zealand. They found 54 with TB. 54 animals out of more than 120,000. There was a transmission trial, transmission trial. That, um, land care carried out in the Orongaronga, which is in the Rumataka, down by Wellington. It was funded by the Marsden Fund and by TB Free, and Landcare inoculated a number of possums, about 32 over a four-year period. Oh, sorry, 232 over a four-year period. They inoculated these possums with TB and let them go in the wild with radio collars. The idea being that they were trying to find out how TB transferred from possum to possum in the wild. Now, 2015, when the results were published in Doc's annual report, they glowingly triumphed that the tests proved but conclusively that TB passed from possum to possum in the wild. What they didn't say 
In the very next paragraph of that same land care paper was a statement that said, however, the rate of transmission was not sufficient to sustain the disease in the wildlife population. Which lends weight to the argument that we've always said, that the real reservoir for TB or bovine tuberculosis in cattle is cattle. Always has been. So, looking ahead, they now have extended their we want to eradicate possums because we want to eradicate TB program through to 2050, along with Predator Free New Zealand, which is another impossible dream. The fact of the matter is that the, the rate of infection of TB in cattle in New Zealand is below the level that it needs to be at for this country to declare ourselves TB free and has been for more than 10 years. It is below the rate that Australia was at when Australia declared itself TB free. It's below the rate that Australia is at now. What they're claiming now is that they want to biologically eradicate, eradicate TB from New Zealand. This is not possible. TB is present in humans, it's present in birds, it's present in fur seals. Ferrets have got it. A few cows have got it. And uh, 54 possums. <laughs> it ain't going away. But it's not actually problematic. A lot of what we hear, a lot of what we're told about TB and 1080 and possums and so forth, I have discovered over the last few years, it's not just a myth, it's lies. TB hasn't actually posed a human health problem to any great degree in New Zealand since we started pasteurising milk. And it doesn't prevent any kind of international trade, apart from the movement of some livestock, which isn't a good idea anyway. A country like Britain, their endemic rate of TB in cattle is 7%. Ours is 0 0.04. The world doesn't end because a few cows show up with TB. Complicating this is the fact that the tests that we use are hopelessly inaccurate. Like a lot of other people, I've, I've sort of heard the anecdotes and I was happy to be thinking that, that the failure rate, the false positive rate for TB test is about 20%. Numbers that we got back, once again, from the Ministry of Prime Industries, shows that of the cattle that show positive on the skin test, and go on to show positive on the blood test and get sent to the works, 76% don't have TB. The test is wrong in three quarters of the time that it shows up positive. And yet if you get a reactor in a herd, that herd is declared a TB infected herd and that skews the figures. We've heard horror stories about farmers losing tens, hundreds of cattle being culled and actually the final wash up, none of them were infected at all. There's a more expensive test that's available. We don't use it in New Zealand because the government's cheap. The reason that we don't have a vaccine for bovine TB in this country is because the tests that we use here are not able to distinguish between cattle that have TB and cattle that have been exposed to the vaccine. But the DNA-based test can do that. It costs about five bucks as opposed to about 50 cents. So for the sake of less than five bucks per test, we carry on dropping tons and tons of this horrible deadly poison all over what is supposed to be a pristine, clean, green wilderness. I've got a question for you. What's green and deadly? Ten eighty bites. Intercontinental ballistic asparagus. And also, ten eighty. Ten eighty. Well, ten eighty itself is green. Ten eighty is colourless. But the baits are green because they dye them. Because apparently, if you dye something green, birds won't eat it. Yeah, right. <laughs> and apparently, if you put a, a a blood-based product imported from Italy into the baits, uh, deer won't eat it either. Yeah, that doesn't work either. So, regardless of what certain people might say, what Forrest and Bird might say, what Doc might say, what uh, Maggie Barry, or um, as she's known around Parliament, the Orange Ruffy, um, might say, <laughs> although just of late people have been referring to her as uh, Rusty Myrtle. <laughs> regardless of what they might say, Sodium monofluoro acetate is a class one deadly poison, according to the World Health Organization. It is one of the 10 most toxic substances known to man. Forrest and Bird claims that, claims that 1080 breaks down into salt and vinegar. 1080 sodium monofluoro acetate does not contain a chlorine ion. It cannot form salt. It is chemically impossible for that substance to break down into vinegar. It is an absolute lie. Forrest and Bird, well, they used to come and see me uh, in Parliament, they don't anymore, I'm not their favourite character. Yep. But organisations such as that, who promote the use of 1080, because they claim that 
It saves more than it kills. It's a necessary evil. We have to do it. There's no alternative. They are essentially the problem. Because you good people here, you know there's an issue, and you know what the issue is. The great majority of New Zealand doesn't. The great majority of New Zealand hear about 1080 through the TV, and they believe the official line is they're told it. Probably 9 out of 10 New Zealanders accept what they're told, that this 1080 stuff is, as the Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment put it, something that we need to be using more of. They don't think about it, it's not something that touches their lives, or it hasn't yet. They may find, many more of them may find, um, in the reasonably near future, that actually it has touched their lives. Because one of the things that we're finding out about 1080, uh, through research that's going on, mostly overseas, is the sublethal effects of it that have not been documented. There's only been one human toxicology study done on 1080. And um, that's not one that we can refer to very much because it was done by Saddam Hussein's regime. And uh, as soon as you start talking about that, you lump in with the conspiracy nutters. But what we do know about the sublethal effects of sodium monofluoric acetate is that it causes animals to abort. It causes increases in miscarriage rates, anything up to 2,000%. And a few years ago, three years ago, two years ago, the Auckland Council did a 1080 drop of the Hunua Ranges, which contains two of Auckland's four reservoir dams. I went to see water care services just prior to that. They were up in arms about it, but being a council organisation, they couldn't say anything. They were dead against having 1080 drop in their catchment. We've now asked for the miscarriage rate figures for Auckland for the three years prior to that drop and the two years since it. And I suspect when we get them back, there'll either be big bits blanked out or a massive spike show. And certain people will have to be answerable to that. The medical officer of health that signed off on that drop. And a prominent politician in this country, uh, who I won't name, although somebody else has, um, who 20 something years ago commissioned and was given a report on the sublethal effects of 1080 on pregnant mothers. That will make a very interesting reading when those two things get put together, when that report comes out and that very prominent politician, very, very prominent politician, has to start explaining why, having known about it for more than 20 years, it's continued to allow it to be used. So look, folks, I don't want to make this political. <coughs> <laughs> but I do, I, do have to, I do have to acknowledge the band 1080 people. Um, they've done a marvellous job all around the country. Um, I, I keep bumping into reprobates like Clyde Graff and Jim Hilton um, at, uh, at various rallies and, and good on them. Um, and, and I do have to say, I passed a couple of Green Party signs when I was driving up here um, from Auckland Airport this morning. The Green Party supports 1080. They're, like, they're one of the organisations that think, well, you know, we don't particularly like it, but it's a necessary evil. That's absolute rubbish. You either support it or you don't. You can't say you do it reluctantly. That's like saying you're a little bit pregnant. <laughs> that doesn't happen either. So, at the moment, in this country, there are two registered parties that are opposed to 1080. One is the banned 1080 party, the other one is New Zealand First. We are going to be the government after the 23rd of September this year. Yeah. And we will end the use of 1080 in New Zealand. Yeah. One, of the, one of the excuses that's given for the use of 1080 is that so much of this country is inaccessible, you can't get to it. You can't trap the pests, you can't shoot them, it's too hard to get to. That's rubbish. Since the invention of the helicopter, no part of New Zealand is inaccessible. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And the use of this poison is based on supposedly there being a problem with native species being threatened and predators threatening them out in these places that are inaccessible. Which begs the question, if these places are so inaccessible that you can't get into them, how do you know what's there? <laughs> the fact of the matter is, the fact of the matter is they've never done the population surveys. They've never been out in these back blocks that get helicopter dumped with 1080 to count the native species and to count the predators. They've just said, well, they must be out there, we can't get there any other way, let's do it. So the first thing that we're going to do is call a halt to airdrops, and we're going to do those surveys. It will take time, it will take money. I'm imagining it will take around three or four years 
to do a survey properly because we have to account for seasonal variations in population. During that three or four year hiatus, we're going to be ramping up trapping, we're going to be ramping up ground control operations. I've been to any number of, of um, well, protest rallies as well, like this one. It's a bit strange actually. Most people go for me to protest to being a politician, I seem to be going the other way. Um, but going to, uh, to trade shows and so forth, AMP shows, field days, and talking to the people who do ground control. And they all tell us, there's nowhere they can't go. Some places are a bit gnarlier to get into, takes a bit longer, costs a bit more. We accept that. We accept that doing ground control and trapping is going to cost more than flying around in helicopters. We're prepared to accept that extra cost because the use of 1080 is unacceptable at any price. So, during, during that period where there are no drops going on, we're doing the surveys, we're ramping up the use of trapping, we are training people in trapping, and we are putting money into research for other methods and alternative compounds, and there are alternative compounds. If at the end of that time we do discover that yes, we do need to drop something from the air, we'll have PAPP or colical cipherol ready to go. The PAPP, no poison is nice, I don't like poison. There are some times when it's necessary. Wasps would be a good example. I'm not fond of wasps. Um, PAPP can be chelated to a particular amino acid which makes it entirely species specific. It's reasonably quick and reasonably humane. Colical cipherol is not particularly humane, no poison is. But at the doses necessary to kill rats and stokes and possums, it won't kill dogs, it won't kill birds. Most importantly, it won't kill deer. And I've been round around this in the head more times than I can count in the last four years. And I look at the 1080 industry, and actually that whole industry could simply swap 1080 for another, another poison and use that instead. And the rest of its gravy train infrastructure would stay in place. But none of the alternatives will kill deer. And I'm convinced that that's the unspoken agenda. They want to wipe deer over the bush. We have said for a while now that introduced species, species that were once introduced, like deer and pigs, goats, wapiti, tar, chamois, they're endemic now. They're naturalised. They're part of New Zealand's wildlife. They live here. There's a place for them. And we, mankind, the apex predator, through sustainable hunting, are the best way of controlling them. So I've come around in a full circle back to supporting hunters, which is where I started off. But in the meantime, in, in between those times, I've discovered a great deal that I didn't know about 1080. I've unlearned a lot of things that I grew up knowing. I grew up knowing that the possum was a pest. I now know that the possum is a resource. The possum fur industry in this country employs about 1,500 people directly, and it generates about $140 million worth of revenue. About 85% of that comes from the sale of the retail sale of garments to overseas tourists. That's more than $100 million worth of foreign exchange coming in to buy possum fur. We have trappers telling us that they've applied for permission to trap certain blocks, and Doc have said, no, we're going to poison them. And these are easy blocks to get into. We've got pet food manufacturers who say they've got unfilled orders from Asia for possum meat pet food. They can't fill them because it has to be from poison-free areas. Possum is a resource going to waste. Possum is a, a unique animal. Trichosaurus vulpecula is one of two animals in the world that has a hollow fibre fur. The other one's the polar bear. That's why possum fur is so good as an insulator. It's one of the, it's one of the best furs for wearing that there possibly is. The global fur industry is worth $40 billion, and the New Zealand possum is the only ethical, humane source of that fur, and we're poisoning it. When we could have people out there trapping, earning, earning a good living, clean living out in the bush, making money for this country, generating wealth, and, and supporting the reputation that, in a lot of cases, we don't actually deserve as a country, this clean green thing. If the story starts to get out, to some of our major tourist markets, for example, that we're dropping this poison all over the place. That could have an enormous negative impact on this country's economy, because tourism is now our biggest exchange, foreign exchange area. It's bigger than dairy. I'm, I'm sure Clyde will touch on this when, uh, when he speaks. And Clyde Graff, way of putting on to Clyde, is one of the, uh, one of the greatest experts um, that this country has on this particular subject, um, and one of the unsung heroes. He has been um, a force for education and a force for change over many years. Um, it's cost him a bit personally, um, as it, I guess it's cost a few other people, but he's stuck at it. But, uh, like all the good stalwarts who keep fighting the good fight, um, I'm not going to go on and on, but I want to say again, thank you all for turning out. Thank you for your welcome. Thank you for your efforts. 
thank you for your faith. And I'll say one thing more. If we all stick together and we keep up at this, we will win. Here's Wendy Pond. She's got a powerhouse of energy, this little lady. Thank you. Excuse me interrupting proceedings, but it's a rare opportunity to present to Richard Prosser the letters that all you good people have written from Eve, from Harper, from community groups, including ecological groups. Richard, please present our letters in Parliament and say that we beg you to restore democratic process so that our desire for a clean environment that we have so eloquently uh, hello everyone, Clyde Graff. Um. Yeah, well, look, I'm, I'm not much of an orator. Uh, and uh, as you can hear from Richard, um, a magnificent speech. Uh, I want to believe, like, I want to believe what Richard says. And then I can walk away right now, and I would. If I can believe what Richard says, and, and New Zealand First will do what they say, we'd all walk away happy, I'm very sure. Uh, and I want to believe, but. I am standing uh, for the Band 1080 party, just in case, trying to keep the whip going behind them. Uh, and a few other good battlers are on that team as well, the Band 1080 party. We are a single party policy, but this is a very important single issue. We all have our different political views, and I have some too, up my sleeve. But I focus on this because I don't want to get distracted, I don't want to be fragmented. Uh, I'm only going to talk a couple of items here because my brother and I, our work, we speak through our video work, our films, uh, our latest, well actually, there's a new website out that I'd like you all to check out before it gets taken down, uh, because it's a little bit, it's a little bit risky, but it's called watersourcenz.org. There's some important information in there for you all. For example, when this aerial poison drop is going to take place in the hills back here, you'll be told, and I'm quite surprised, that a couple of the buffer, larger streams are going to get a little bit of buffering. But as Shelley pointed out, all those streams are made up of the small poison streams anyway, so it's all poison. The Ministry of Health may request that water testing is undertaken. The water testing will be undertaken when the poison has already been uptaken by the wildlife, the aquatic life, the plant life, and will pass through the water channel at 24 hours or more after the aerial drop. Land care research states that the poison uh, should be, the poison test should be undertaken within eight hours of an aerial poison drop for it to be detected. So you get the likes of Maggie and, and Doc and Animal Health or TB Free or whoever they are claiming that they never have any detected 1080 in water tests because they simply pull these tests that are not looking for the poison. The Medical Office of Health was asked, sorry, the uh, Ministry of Health was asked by myself a couple of months ago or a month or so ago whether there is any epidemiology uh, studies undertaken into human health and, and low dose chronic uh, studies and the response was no there isn't. When we put out Poisoning Paradise in 2009 we identified that issue and it's still not a single study has been done and yet they're not giving you buffered water supplies up here. So there is a one point I'd like to make on with regard to the M Medical Officer of Health's permission document and I think it's clause number 25 states that if you live within three kilometres of a drop boundary and you draw water from within a stream that comes from that bound, from within the drop area, you're entitled to either a buffer from your intake or bottled water until the water tests come back uh, clear. Well, there won't be any water tests, etc. But uh, so you are entitled to uh, bottled water if you ask for it. 
The thing with the uh, Medical Officer of Health's permission document is that it's not a public document. You need to, I think, get an OIA to actually get the thing. <laughs> but, but on that uh, Water Source website, watersourcenz.org, is an example of it under the water category. Have a look and then try and use it and see, see where it gets you. Uh, you because you should be entitled to um, alternative water. Uh, the other issue is, of course, uh, animal carcasses. People say, oh, animal carcasses don't fall in the waterways. Well, they most certainly do. We've filmed them for years in the water, in, in, the, uh, in the streams. And uh, there's a, there is information on the uh, toxicity of that and the risks and the E. coli risks, etc. But that's, once again, you can look on that website um, to cover that. Uh, I think one other area that really is impacting us at the moment is the fact that we have fairly good evidence now that kiwi uh, are being killed in aerial poison operations. They're not doing well. They, they are, uh, the Department of Conservation claim that it saves kiwi, but the evidence is showing it's the opposite. We have information on the uh, same website 